Welcome and thank you for joining us on this first Sunday of Advent. While community worship, even when the community is gathered in spirit rather than body, is a unique and important practice for those who want to deepen both their understanding of and engagement in a spiritual life, we also want to lift up some opportunities to get, engage in in other forms of ministry. Sue Erickson and I are offering an Advent study using the book Incarnation, Rediscovering the Significance of Christmas by Adam Hamilton. This class is offered via Zoom on Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. and again on Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m. Attendance at either time is flexible to fit your schedule. The books are here now in the office, so you can contact the church office to get your book. And we also urge the men in our congregation to join us in this study. We have devotional booklets that are available to be used during the season of Advent. If you would like a booklet, you can either arrange a time to pick one up from the church office or contact the office and we can mail one out to you. Have you gotten out your Christmas decorations yet? When you do, Pastor Terry is asking folks to take a short 30 to 60 second video on your phone either while you're decorating or after you've finished, then send them to him for use for the worship videos during the Christmas and Advent seasons you are invited to participate in any of our weekly Zoom gatherings. Sister of the Heart meets on Tuesday mornings at 10 a.m. The Men's Morning Ministry is Thursday mornings at 8.30 a.m. And General Church Chat and Fellowship Times on Thursday afternoons at 1.30 and Sunday mornings at 11.15. As we move further into worship, Pastor Terry has prepared a couple of questions to ponder during our time together related to the topic of this service for the first Sunday of Advent. The first question is, in the dark moments of life, do you cry out to God? And secondly, can and will you fully engage the challenges of the season, the better to truly celebrate the miracle of Christmas when it arrives? Our opening prayer is adapted from Psalm 80, from Nan Merrill's book, Psalms for Praying. You are invited to hear these words as an anguished cry from a people on the verge of desperation to the very God they are afraid may have abandoned them, their fears and their hope mingling with prayer. Eternal listener, give heed to your people, you who are our guide and our light, you who dwell amidst the angels, shine forth into the heart of all nations. Enliven your people with compassion, so that peace and justice might flourish. Restore us, O Holy One. Let your face shine upon us and teach us to love. Gentle teacher, help us to turn to you in prayer, fasting from our fears and negative thoughts. In your steadfast love, you weep with our tears tears that rise from fear, doubt, and illusion. Receive your gratitude, O heart of all hearts. Look upon us and see what love can do. Rejoice in the new birth that you create. Restore us, O Holy One. Let your face shine upon us and teach us to love. Amen. Oh, 
If ever there was a year we needed Advent, this is the year. We hardly know how to describe the year we have lived through. We hesitate to reflect on all the mess around us in 2020. All we know is that nothing seems right. Nothing seems like it used to be. Nothing. We need Advent. The prophet Isaiah cried out for us, Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down to make your name known, so that nations might tremble at your presence. So tear through the mess, O Lord, and come down to us again. We long to be your people, a people of hope. We light this first Advent candle as a sign of our hope. Hope that you can meet us, even in the mess of our world. Hope that you still see us, though we feel we are lost in the rubble. Let this light be the guide that brings us to Emmanuel once more. O come, O come, Emmanuel. We start this Advent journey with a reading from Isaiah, bringing the fears and needs of the people who are under siege, the armies of Babylon outside their gates, to their God. I'll be reading verses 1 through 9 of the 64th chapter of Isaiah from the Voice Bible. Listen to how it begins with wishes and fantasies, moves to remembrances, then confession, and finally to hope. If only you would rip open the heavens and come down to earth, its heights and depths would quake the moment you appear. Like kindling when it just begins to catch fire, or like water that's about to boil. If only you would come like that, so that all who deny or hate you would know who you are and be terrified of your grandeur. We remember that long ago you did amazing things for us, that we had never dreamed you'd do. You came down and the mountains shook at your presence. Nothing like that had ha ever happened before. No eye had ever seen and no ear had ever heard such wonders. But you did them then for the sake of your people, for those who trusted in you. You meet whoever tries with sincerity of purpose to do what you want, to do justice and follow in your ways. But you become so angry when we rebelled and committed all sorts of wrongs. We have continued in our sins for a long time, so how can we be saved? We are all messed up, like a person compromised with impurity. Even all our right efforts are like soiled rags. We're drying up like a leaf in autumn and are blown away by wrongdoing. And it's so sad because no one calls out to you or even bothers to approach you anymore. You've been absent from us too long. You left us to dissolve away in the acrid power of our sins. Still, Eternal One, you are our Father. We are just clay and you are the potter. We are the product of your creative action, shaped and formed into something of worth. Don't be so angry anymore, O Eternal. Don't always remember our wrongs. Please look around and see that we are all your people.
Our gospel reading comes from the opening of the Gospel of Mark, which jumps right into the story by reconnecting the listeners with Isaiah's prophecy from several hundred years earlier, which John the baptizer fulfills. I will be reading the first 11 verses of chapter 1 of Mark from the New Revised Standard Version. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As we begin the season of Advent this year, I think we're actually better prepared for it in some ways than, than we've probably ever been before as a, as a community of faith, as a, as a large community, um, in that we already have, we've been spending some time, more time certainly than we ever wanted to, in what really we can think of as a wilderness setting. And that's where we really always begin Advent. It's, uh, it's part of the challenge of the Advent season, just as with Lent and Easter, the season coming before the High Holy Day, in this case of Christmas, is always intended to be a time of preparation. And so often that requires us to kind of imagine ourselves in some kind of wilderness place in our lives. Um, and as I said last week, wilderness needs to be understood as a place of, of surprise, of unpredictability, but also as a place where God is most likely to be encountered, perhaps because it's a place of unpredictability. And we are, just by knowing that, warned to remember that God cannot be predicted. So this time around, we have had these months of uncertainty, of fearfulness, of living with a daily, hourly barrage of difficult news. And that ought to give us a chance to quite readily identify with the situation of the time in which Jesus was born and lived. Because it was very true at that time as well that for the vast majority of people, even the simple, basic question of will we all survive this day was, was a valid question most days. And so, well, I know that we, we're yearning already for the joy and the love of the Christmas celebration. It's just very appropriate that we start this, this season of preparation focused on hope and remembering why we need hope and what it is that we might be hoping for. Isaiah is always a, um, a major part of the Advent process in large part because Jesus refers frequently to the book of Isaiah, the prophecies there. Um, 
and reinterprets them as he does with so many things, even as he fulfills some of them. And as we saw in our gospel reading, John the Baptist fulfilling the role of the one who comes first to announce, to prepare, to warn, to encourage, to draw folks into uh, an, an experience of awakeness and awareness, the better to begin to notice what's happening in their world, where change is needed and where it is beginning to be experienced. So I just love that the reading from Isaiah kind of began with a with a cry for God to just to please listen, to hear us, to to let us know that you haven't abandoned us. Remembering that this comes toward the end of the period of about 50 or so years in exile in Babylon, one of the two great periods of exile in Israel's history. The first being, of course, in much longer in Egypt, 400 years or more. This one being about 50 years, but we need to remember that that was probably pretty close to three generations of time. The people that are in Babylon and are about to be freed when Babylon is superseded by uh, another local power and the Persians. The, those people there, when they think about going home to Israel, to Jerusalem in particular, they only know about Jerusalem from stories. They haven't, the vast majority of them have never been in Jerusalem. But to be freed from slavery, from, well, not really slavery. In, in Babylon, they weren't slaves, but to be freed from exile, to have the choice to go back to where their ancestors had lived, um, is certainly something they hoped for. But just as with the time when the people came out of Egypt, being freed from the control of others brings with it certainly initially a great elation and a sense of excitement, but pretty quickly what begins to settle in is the recognition that, wow, that suddenly means we have choices and we're the ones in charge of our lives. And we no longer can say that we fail to live up to God's hopes for us because we're oppressed. We have to begin to take responsibility for the extent to which and the ways in which we do or do not live into the possibilities God has in mind for us and has, has imbued us with. So we begin, out with, begin this season in the wilderness, crying out and then remembering remembering that we have these stories from our ancestors, those who came with us into captivity, those who raised us up physically and in the faith, those saints of our lives who told us about how God used to come, used to be known almost firsthand, in fact, and how frightening that was when God truly tore the heavens apart and came down to meet Moses face to face on Mount Sinai and how exciting but also terrible and terrifying that was. But there's a memory that we've had this kind of relationship with God before, the all-powerful, the creator, the sustainer. We've been that close to God. God cared that much. And then moving from from that memory to a time of confession, of acknowledging that, yeah, we as a people, as well as as individuals, we really haven't done our part of the arrangement of being faithful to the call on our lives. 
And then finally, that passage from Isaiah moves to, to hope. And I, I've said this before, but I think it's important to recognize that this is a place where hope is as much based on desperation as it is on faith. We, we have to hope. We have to believe that this is not our um, eternal experience. And so the begin, beginning of hope that isn't resting on us alone, but on a relationship, a relationship with God that is lived out among humans and how we treat one another, how we live together. So we want to um, keep in mind, and it's certainly not a coincidence by any means, that the, the fulfillment of the Isaiah message of the one who would come before the promised one, who would make the ways straight, the roads straight, um, is being fulfilled by John, who's this well, unique character. We, we hear it in Mark's Gospel. We hear John described as a, as a man living out in the wilderness, out by the Jordan River, clothed with camels here. And, and we need to set aside any image we might get of a fine camel hair coat that very wealthy people might buy in a fancy uh, shop. This is a rough garment that is made out of whatever was available there um, to do the, do the job uh, they need to do. He's got a leather belt around the waist. Couldn't be any simpler than this, more primitive, living off the land. And this is the one whose job it is to wake folks up, to arouse them, to help them to get ready so that when the promised one comes, there's a greater likelihood that they might be tuned in, that they might not be so slow to recognize that that's who is before them. So John is declaring that uh, essentially wake up, but saying right right uh, from the get-go, I, I'm, I'm not the one you've been waiting for. I'm the one who came to wake you up so you're ready when that one comes. And that one, the difference between me and him is so vast that I'm not even really worthy to kneel down before him and touch him to untie the thongs of his sandals. That would be presumptuous of me. And know that I am baptizing in water. An experience that probably was relatively pleasant out in the desert to be immersed in the water for that cleansing experience, that new life experience, that repetition of birth experience. But this one who will come will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And, and we hear in other places that's really described as being baptized with fire. We should evoke our, our memory of the Pentecost day when flames touched people. And that was the representation, the physical manifestation or the metaphor for, for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So as we enter into this time of, of preparation, of of shifting from passive, perhaps disinterested, even distracted waiting to a time of focused, intentional, hopeful waiting. My hope and prayer is that we will allow ourselves to experience the, the rich depths of our fears now of our um, sense of disconnection from God, of any, any feelings we may have that we're not sure if God is still with us, to go ahead and experience those, to not hide from them, 
but let them be part of our preparation. Not to be overcome by them, but to allow them time in our lives, to allow them a place in our lives, a conscious, intentional place, even as we do the same thing that uh, the Isaiah reading led us towards, that we cry out, that we remember those other times in our lives when surely God has felt very near, that we acknowledge our own failures to, to respond consistently with the kind of love and care that God intends us to do, to share, to experience, to let flow through us, the better to bring us further along the journey, even as it engages others on the journey and puts the heart into them as well. And then ultimately, to move ever more deeply through this season into a position of hope, of real hope, not of fantasy, not of wishing, but of hope, because in hope we begin to act. Wishes, wishes are what I have when I buy a lottery ticket. I wish I might win. I honestly can't say, even when I'm handing the money over, that I'm hopeful. Hope is something that draws us forward. It moves us further into the story, further into our own story. And the further we go into the story, the closer we draw to one another. The more we think of ways that we can be supportive and helpful and encouraging to others, knowing that that encourages and supports and helps us as well. So may we be a people who is willing to truly experience this time of, of movement through wilderness and to uh, carry with us in that time the hope that in fact is based on our remembrance of the sure experience of God being with us. Emmanuel, God with us. Amen and amen. So we come back once again to a time of prayer. I want to begin by lifting up in prayer those who have just experienced a, a new kind of Thanksgiving, a Thanksgiving without a loved one who they've lost since this time last year. Um, prayer that they might be comforted and and allow space in their own lives for both the gratitude for all the years previously, all the thanksgivings and special days and mundane days spent together, might be allowed to mingle with the grief of this quieter time, this quieter day, this time of... Uh, certainly remembering them, but not having the privilege of having them across the table. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I also want to invite you to uh, hold in prayer those who traveled during this holiday and those who received travelers, especially travelers that came longer distances by bus or plane or any kind of public transportation, that all those folks, the travelers, all the folks that they encountered along the way, as well as the folks that they visited with, might have a renewed sense of commitment to um, follow up that joyful time with a time of responsibility, of being more 
separate, more uh, conscientious about not going out unnecessarily and of wearing masks and distancing when they do go out, uh, that we might minimize any additional surge in this virus as a result of this holiday. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I want to lift up somebody by a couple people by name. I haven't been doing that much, but I'm going to share just first names. And I want to begin by asking you to pray for nine-year-old Carter and his family. Carter's recently been diagnosed with a form of leukemia, A-L-L. I will not begin to I will not try to uh, share that full name with you, but um, we know this is a devastating kind of news for any family. And at the same time, there is some bits of silver on the lining and that the family was advised that if you're going to have to deal with cancer, this is one of the least devastating ones to find out you're going to deal with, that we have good treatment for this. Uh, and in this particular case, it sounds like it was caught at a good point. Tests have come back that show it's not widespread. And so there's reason for hope in here. But please, not only today and in this coming week, but in the weeks and months ahead, hold Carter and his family in your prayers as uh, his older brother and his parents and grandparents all go through this process of great trial and struggle. That they might feel always connected, supported, and feel the holy presence in and around them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I want to also lift up my friend Raymond, who was scheduled to have a surgery yesterday morning up in Bellingham, uh, an attempt to bring a better blood flow to his foot where he needs some healing that has not been accomplished because he wasn't getting enough blood there. So prayers that that surgery um, accomplishes all that it was intended to accomplish with no unexpected side effects and that his foot really begins to experience that life-renewing force of a greater blood flow. And for his wife, Mary Ellen, as she, of course, walks through this as they've walked through so many other things together in their decades together. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Please continue to pray for our nation and all the leaders of both parties, but particularly for those who are preparing to take over the extraordinary responsibilities of running our federal government, of uh, senators and congresspeople and governors and folks in, in uh, states, as well as those who are leaving, that there might be a, a helpful spirit of cooperation for the sake of the nation in that whole process. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And again, I ask that we pray not only with our words, but with our actions to, to be imbued with a renewed spirit of commitment out of the, provided by the hope of the news about some vaccines on our horizon. Uh, that we might be truly renewed in our sense of commitment to wearing our masks, to avoiding contact where we can, to keep our distances, to do all the things that we can do to continue to minimize the dramatic toll of this virus before those vaccines have a chance to be distributed and begin to be administered and take effect. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. So let us join together in a spirit of hope as we lift up the Lord's Prayer together. Let us pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. As we once again prepare to leave our community worship in our separate places, may we indeed embrace the reality that if ever there was a year that we needed Advent, this is probably that year. And in doing so, may we in fact find hope in this wilderness season. Not merely wishing for things to get better, but trusting that God does, in fact, hear the cries both of our mouths and of our hearts, knows our tears, and, in fact, has plans for our well-being. And may we line up our words and our actions as living prayers. In this way, may we be fully present to both our current circumstances and the circumstances that the whole world finds itself in, while still embodying the name and the spirit and the likeness and the hope of the Christ, letting his light both enter us, shine through us, and in that way enlighten the darkness around us. Amen and amen. Thanks for joining us. Stay safe. Stay well. We hope to have you join us again. Bye-bye.